Okay, we're rolling. Hi, I'm Michael Stevenson. Uh, I'm the Producing Artistic Director of Capital Stage and with me tonight, a very special guest, Lena Klingeman. Lena, Hello. introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Lena. Um, I'm an actress and singer-songwriter in New York City, uh, in Queens currently. Originally, I'm from San Francisco, the Bay Area. I had a little stint in Minneapolis and here I am. And uh, you were the star of our Anna Karenina several years yeah. ago, about five or six I mean, years ago. Unbelievably. Much beloved experience. You did an amazing job. Um, and we were just talking and I realized, oh my God, I've known you for 13 years. I remember being at the gym with you when the bridge collapsed in Minneapolis. Do you remember that? Yes. Do you remember oh that? God. That totally crazy, totally nutty time. Yeah, um, yeah I just stopped on the treadmill. And my oh my God lives there and my mom works by that bridge and I just, ooh, that was, that was a crazy time. So I would love for you, can you just give a little prissy of your career and what you, you know, how did you get started? Actually, you know, what, what interested you about theater in the first place? Uh, I probably the first, I think at a very young age, I was like, just loved storytelling and like doing weird voices and liked reading my, my mom read stories to my brother and I, I have a younger brother. Um, uh, out loud all the times. And then when we started to be able to read, we read to each other. And then I just had, you know, an interesting, weird childhood of like making up characters <laughs> into a mirror. <laughs> I was just home at my childhood home. As you do. Sitting, yes, as you do, just entertaining yourself in a mirror. Um, but like, and my brother and I also were addicted to um, the Saturday Night Live CD-ROM of, <laughs> I don't know if you remember it. They, I, it was like, yeah. CD-ROM very cool and um I'm probably now you mean just the music or, or the actual movie no actual things like it, it created the set the cd-rom was the set or not the cd-rom it brought the like main page up you know and you could click on different things to make them go oh it was like interactive yes and so oh my we God. Into the whole skit um and it was like ranging in you know the current cast to like i don't know how far like there was dana carvey and there was um, the chop and broccoli. <laughs> um, I don't know if you know that one, but like we would just mimic um, and learn. I think I learned my comedy from there. This is all in my mind because literally I spent six months of COVID in my childhood home. So oh my god! Like memories were like, oh right, we did that, and um, I was <laughs> to Ace Ventura and like his timing, um, his comedic timing of just everything from how he face plant into something. So I, I studied it really young and then didn't know that theater was a thing that I could do really. I mean, I went to, um, I, I actually was very fortunate and had um, grandparents who lived an hour outside of New York City and they took me to my first shows um, on Broadway, wow. that, being Broadway shows and, um, but I guess growing up in San Francisco, I didn't see a ton but um, I got to about high school actually, and we were, you know, learning Shakespeare, and I loved literature from a young age. And I had a great English teacher um, who basically said the only way to learn Shakespeare is to speak it out loud. And he made all of us at our desks stand up and read these scenes, which was super awkward, it was like Romeo and Juliet and 13 year olds. <laughs> who were just like blushing and but I was like, yes. <laughs> and just, you know, was a little eager and I just moved to Minneapolis from San Francisco. So, you know, I was probably a lot, but, um, but I think I, something like came alive in both me loving, you know, I had loved so much like the reading and the literature of it and then getting something happened when I got to speak it. And then I think that really led me to auditioning for a play, which was, I believe it was end of freshman year, beginning of sophomore. And that was the first time I auditioned for a play. Didn't know how to do it. Didn't know anyone who could tell me how. So they said you had a, needed a monologue. I didn't even know you needed to like memorize. <laughs> I just got a book out of the library that had um, monologues. And I think I found the tuna. You know what I'm talking about? The tuna monologue? No. Um, Chris, Dur is it Durang? Oh, yeah. oh. I think uh, it's, it's been a while now, which one I did, but I think that's what, what it was. Yeah, we'll see. I might be wrong, but 
and I just read it. And I just was like kind of doing me in a mirror on a stage. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't know what I was doing. And they cast me as one of the sisters in Damn Yankees. <laughs> it, I've never looked back. <laughs> wow. So, um, yeah, no, that's an amazing start. And then, so you did high school and theater. I'm, I'm guessing more of it. Yeah. Yes, I did. I did a, um, I was really lucky. I had a really, um, interesting, I've been really lucky with like being in classes, groups of people who, um, as I'm saying this, it's, it's formed who I am kind of, um, who were really collaborative and created sort of, um, the, the, basically the, like the projects they wanted to make the program they wanted to see happen. And so my class of um, high schoolers, we had uh, filmmakers and playwrights and directors and lots of actors, um, dancers. And we basically built the, the theater program at, um, at our high school into something even more robust. And we had mm -hmm. a great teacher there. Um, and we had a lot of wonderful like faculty members who would sign on to allow us to do it. But we would just create, the program didn't say like, here are the shows. We like did a version of Cabaret. I played Sally Bowles in my senior year. We had to like get the okay for the costumes from the vice <laughs> principal. <laughs> Awkward. Um, but, but like my friends wrote these really cool, like kind of in the vein of clue, like mystery dramas. And we did for the same teacher, like takes, we did, you know, um, videos of takes on like Macbeth and for our for our class projects instead of writing papers. So we had a really amazing class and I'm still friends with them and they're still very creative in different places. And then the same was true for college. I So I had done these like everything from musical theater to movement stuff in high school to like new contemporary works and classic stuff. And then went to college at UC Santa Cruz and was able to kind of apprentice under professionals at Shakespeare Santa Cruz, which it was yeah. then, um, and be in professional shows, be in their panto shows, and be an um, intern in the summer for, for the um, actual Shakespeare Santa Cruz summer stock. And then um, also we had like, they were very kind of avant-garde, the actual theater program, and got to like dip my toes into the whole thing and then um, actually found out about ACT and their summer training Congress and basically knew because of my program at, at Santa Cruz, it wasn't a, a BFA or anything, but it was enough to sort of make me want more. And so I decided to test if I wanted to go into that um, further to try this like nine week intensive at, um, at ACT. I totally forgot course. that you did that. We yeah. had, you probably had some of my teachers for sure. I did. Yes, I oh think I was a person. I think I was like, oh my god, you know, blah blah blah, and blah blah blah. It was, it was a dream come true. I was like, this yeah. is it. It married everything because even growing up, as you heard, like I'm, I love literature. I loved reading. I also loved art history and curation, and thought maybe I could go into that. And just acting and um, uh, Melissa at, at, at ACT led a, like a um, text analysis class, and I was just hooked was just hooked on R and J and I, yeah, decided to get an MFA. <laughs> so you went to UW. Yep. And was it directly out of UW that you went to Lake Tahoe Shakes? Is that? Yeah, is that, that, that summer oh that I graduated okay. and went right into it. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's where we yeah. met a million That's years right. ago. Somewhere yeah. around, I've still got that picture of me as a friar and you as Juliet from a yes. thousand years ago. You know, the world is so small in theater because I think about ACT and then I think when we went down to see you at Midsummer's at Santa Cruz and Jay Todd was in that class, right? Yes. And, and so you and I had like six different connections without knowing it, like off the bat, it's crazy. Just like, um, they continue. Let me, oh yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I hope so. Um, let me, uh, I'm gonna skip just a little bit ahead. UW is an amazing training program. And I remember that whole class of you guys was really, really, Quinn and you and Barzan and all those guys. Um, yeah. But I wanna, I wanna jump ahead. So you moved to New York. Yep. And why, what possessed you to move to New York? My God. Yeah, well, I actually, um, I actually think I would have moved there right after 
grad school, but I'm a California kid. And I, so I went to LA first and did about eight years in LA. I forgot and about that. It didn't, it didn't just, it, it was a great place to like try out different things. And I did some cool, like new media stuff and um, in a lot of theater. And I just kept leaving to go do regional theater that I still sits with me as like some of my favorite stuff I've ever done. And I'd go back to LA and it was like, why'd you leave? And I eventually just was like, I, this is what my heart is telling me to do. And that living that way and, and seeking out like projects like that and people like that, that I want to work with, it just made more sense to be in New York. So I actually did the reverse. A lot of people go to New York first and then they go to LA. Los Angeles, and yeah. Did the opposite. Um, and so I've been in New York now for four and a half years, close to five now, but, um, oh my God. and, and it's, I'm really happy that I did it. it. It just feels like the right community. You know, I don't know how long I'll be anywhere, you know, it's like, you want to have a family, you want to do all these things, but it, it works right now. And, um, I love it. I just love the community and the, and stuff started to take off on the East coast of things. So. I, you know, I've noticed, I, I was talking to Jamie the other day about why people stay in the business and how do they survive in such a difficult business. And we were thinking about all these people we know, and you were amongst them, and that they're willing to make radical change and take big risks. I mean, because it's a big risk. And I think that that kind of defines that you can stay because you've got the courage to, to keep at what's a crazy profession. It's crazy. Um, can you tell me the story? So now you're in New York and you keep auditioning for things and then suddenly you're a reader for this unknown musical. One of my favorite movies, by the way, I love that movie. Me too. Nathan Fillion, unbelievable, unbelievable yeah. movie. Um, but tell me the story of being a reader for Waitress. So, um, so I knew about the movie um, because I was a huge Adrienne Shelley fan uh, growing up who is the, um, main actress, but the writer and director of the movie, uh, who ha has passed away and was is is like a icon and mentor in some way to me watching her work. So the story actually starts when I was living in LA. I was um, through our friend Karen Castle. Yeah, we all go way back. Um, she had put me in touch with people who were coming to um, uh, audition people in LA for the world premiere of Waitress uh, in mm. at ART. And I didn't know anything about it. I knew the movie and I was like, sure, I'll be the reader. And the reader is one who um, audition, isn't auditioning, but helps read with the actors who are coming into audition. So you're doing scenes with sometimes, I mean, 10, sometimes a hundred different actors playing all the different roles. So I knew the material and it was really fun. And I remember was with Diane Paulus in the room and um, I came home after like one of the first, first days. And this was a long, long time ago and didn't know it was going to go to Broadway and came to my, my husband who was then not my husband and said, do you think I could sing this? Like, do you think I could sing any of these songs? And we like played a little bit around and I was like, well, I don't know. And I just it was, it was like wanted to go to Broadway. And I just thought I, I was too shy at that point, I think. And hadn't hadn't done a musical in a while um, yeah. outside of school, and so let it ride. Um, came to New York, and one of the first, like, just side jobs I had. Karen works here was being a reader at Chelsea in New York, and so especially with the musicals, because there's a lot of great acting, and like it 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 re requires, you know, like a, a readers. Not to pat myself on the back, but read <laughs> more than a block of wood. Quick actor, you know, yeah. and so it's they they hire wonderful actors for the for these auditions. And I, side note, highly recommend any actor, especially in the beginning, but even later into your career, yeah, be a reader. Um, do it. Be a reader because I learned so quickly what to do, what not to do, what people do, and you can pat yourself on the back and go, I don't do that. <laughs> like, but also like. The different, the different ways you can interpret a character and go, I never would have thought of that. And it just opened my mind up. And also you meet really wonderful people who are still now friends because I was in a room with them for, you know, a week auditioning their play that half the time there's, it's not like there's a part for me necessarily in all of them, yeah. but waitress happened to be one. Uh, and I was a reader for it right when I got to New York 
and then went to go do my first gig at, in New York was to go do a show at ART called Fingersmith, where Diane Paulus is the- Oh my God, I saw that at Ashland. That's crazy. Oh, it was so good. Yeah. Um, and so then Diane saw my work. She didn't direct it, but saw my work. And then the first gig back after that show, in between me about to go to do another show, was being a reader for Waitress for a couple days. And at this point, they're like, she's recognizing me. They've seen me before. Sarah's in the room again, Sarah Bareilles. And so this time, you know, I'm, it was like five days and they were auditioning for Broadway replacements and for the national tour, which I don't know. I didn't know that world very well. I didn't come thinking I would be in musical theater. I really loved um, classic and straight plays and um, had done musicals, you know, younger, but just kind of didn't give myself a real shot at it. And I just noticed like, like a day into it, like Sarah was like looking at me funny and <laughs> like people kept looking at me and I was having so much fun being like eight different characters and they're laughing and we're having a great time. And, and you're, so you're sitting on a chair off to the side, right? While the other yes. actor is up in the center of the room, just yes. so, so just like, everybody yeah. knows. And every, all of the like amazing women who are, and the producers who are involved in Waitress are here because Waitress is now on Broadway at this point in time. And there's just like a table full of them and like Chelsea is filming it. And I don't know, there's like 12 people in the room and I'm at this corner <laughs> here. And, and we're just having a great time and, you know, I'm just like enjoying being in the room. And at the end of it, um, I, I like, I think it was my last day of auditioning. No, I had one more day of being a reader and I walked out to go to the bathroom and like Diane, I, as I came back out, Diane was like following me, trying to find me in the bathroom and was like, do you sing? Do you sing at all? And I happened to have made a, the year before an album of some originals and some covers. And I said, well, I have not done a musical in a while but I have an album you can listen to it and then she was like we'll be in touch and <laughs> like the person that is giving me you know like a job to be a reader is like okay so we're going to prepare you for this audition um send me your album oh I sent him some tracks and uh and they brought me in and they were like so wonderful so hands-on they had picked Dawn the role they wanted to see me for and I got to like and that was Adrian Shelley's role that was Adrian Shelley's role, okay, yeah. so, um, which was like extremely yeah. near and dear to my heart because it was her and her humor kind of, like I said, I love watching comedians. It kind of shaped me. I watched a lot of her Hal Hartley films when I was in high school. Um, if you have ever seen them, everyone watching, like if you haven't, go see them. Um, yeah, they're amazing. Uh, I actually went to a Hal Hartley film festival this last year in New oh. York before COVID and Oh, my heart was so happy, but she's just an incredible performer and incredible mind. And we lost her too soon, but I just, I basically went home and was like, I'm going to do Adrienne Shelley's. <laughs> I'm gonna, I don't know what's on Broadway. I, don't know what I, I just, so I'd like did a weird voice. I asked Mark, my husband, I was like, is, is this too much? This is not what they're, you know, and he's like, go for it. And, and then yeah, the rest is history. I mean, it took, it was a lot of work. I'm, I'm shortening the story a bit, but it was a lot of work. They, um, they, they worked with me on like singing stuff. They wanted a specific kind of, you know, tone for the, the music. Um, Diane was really happy with like where the, the uh, comedy was. So I got to kind of keep that. And then I realized that they were looking at me for like originating the role in the tour which was insane and it meant like I got to like rehearse it and kind of bring my style yeah. to it, um, which you're not always afforded. So I was really lucky and then got, got to bring that. But I had like a one-on-one -on -one time with Sarah and um, Nadia, our music director, oh my gosh. And music supervisor. And it like, I remember, I'll never forget like Nadia's on keys and like, Sarah's, the, you know, this far singing at my face. And she's like, now sing that back. And I'm singing at her face, just like, this is fine. If I don't get this job, I get to have this moment. This is great. And yeah, and then I got to, got to do the show and did it for a year on tour and toured the whole country and then did it for about eight months on Broadway. That's absolutely amazing. That's an yeah. incredible story. I just love that, you know, everybody's kind of looking at you weird. <laughs> and you're like, did I not wear something yeah. right or, I was know. like oh maybe I'm doing that you know but 
that's as it should be. You should be up there. I remember, I'll tell you this, I don't know if you ever told you this. So back when, way, way, way back when Anna Karenina was getting cast, so there was another actress had been cast in the, in the lead role and she dropped out like literally five days before rehearsal. And the show is all, all on all the time, constantly. Never, like, not a, a break. Off stage? No. Yeah. And uh, Stephanie called me and said, hey, I need, I need a hitter. I need somebody. And I said, oh, here. And I just handed your name over. And, you know, to, to be in that place where people refer to you that way and go, yes, and here's the thing. That's, that's a very special thing. You've got an enormous drive and talent. So I've always admired I it. I love you. Oh, <laughs> get out. Yeah. Hey, but I, you know what I want to ask you too? Um, tell me about your music career. So this is a whole other thing. Like, is Louisiana the diamond of the album or is it just that one cut? Uh, that's just one cut. That okay, is, I love that song, by the way. It's a great song. Yeah, that is, um, that is like one of my favorite songs. Um, uh, Randy Newman wrote that song. Uh, yeah. All Newman brothers, David, um, Thomas, and Randy. All incredible, incredible musical talents. Astonishing well, people. Wonderful men. Yeah. But tell me, so tell me, how did that happen? Not everybody yeah. just goes, I happen to have an album here. No, exactly. Yeah. It was a very, it, I would talk about a weird, the, one of the things that I feel like this career especially keeps showing you, any artistic career probably, for that matter, is yeah. like, just, if you have something in you, like, <clears throat> and you don't know where it's going to take you and you're not really sure it's going to lead to something you can't even see what it might lead to but you have that urge like and i'm telling myself this right now cuz i'm trying to write a second album like just follow it because you don't you don't know i think i was so scared to do that first one and i'm now scared to do this one but um because it was like who wants to hear this thing that we're making and it was just an idea with my father and i um like I'm not gonna win a Grammy, but you don't do it to like win a Grammy. You know who am I to do that? And I just made it, and it was. It started because my dad and I. My dad is a musician and writer, and we've sung together since I was I don't know four. We made like a really crazy, like mixtape for the zoo, the San Francisco <laughs> Zoo, because I was really mad about the the cages that the that were so small for the tigers, and it was like a weird <laughs> zoo. And it had music and, and tiger noises. And I was like doing spoken word. And so anyway, we've created uh -huh. these hilarious <laughs> projects together. They're not usually hilarious. That one was unintentionally so I think now. But um, I just wanted those tigers not to pace. But, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we, I sang back up for him from a really young age. Like, our, and a lot of, a lot of fathers and daughters and people in, families sing together because like they can harmonize well and um and he would write little things for me uh, as I got older and we made a couple albums of his and I always knew I wanted to do something and he was like we'll make something for you and so it was on sort of our plans to do and my goal at that time was kind of I've always written things here and there but it was like I love covers I love the um styling I was sort of brought up on the stylings of like the way Linda Ronstadt and Emmy Lou Harris, especially, uh, and yeah. Molly sing like classics. And so these ideas of like a vocal record, it didn't seem that weird to me. And so it just was like picking everything from Randy Newman, which um, was that Louisiana is the song that like brought my husband and I together because we both knew it by heart and sang it just randomly. And we're like, uh oh. But, um, but. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, blah, blah, blah. But uh, <laughs> like Peter Gabriel and then like Wayfaring Stranger. And so, and then my dad had written me this gorgeous song for like kind of the time in my life, which I was going through a divorce. And um, he had written me The Heart is the Hunter. And and then we collaborated a little bit on that and, a, and one, one or two other um, originals. And it just kind of became this beautiful project for us over a few, quite a few years like maybe four or five. And then my husband joined um, on the tail end to be our amazing piano man and sure. help co-produce and we took it to Nashville and then we made it. And then it got on some folk radio stations and I was so just proud of that, that people listened and, you know, wanted to hear something that we put our hearts into and put out there and didn't necessarily, I just was like, I'm done, I made this thing. And then it came, it, it, it was a heavy it was handy. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, and I got this out by me. Who knew? <laughs> like, so I want to ask you a couple other questions. Um, yeah. 
first one is why theater? Now that COVID has come and just shut everything down, why would you go back into this crazy business? What What is it about theater? You know, there's television, there's film, there's... Uh, I have my answer so ready because I've been okay. just ruminating on it yeah. for seven plus months. Collaboration. Like mm -hmm. I miss other people so much and Zoom is great, but being in the room, there's nothing like rehearsing and being in the room. And yeah, there's a director and it's not like a free for all, but you're, you're making art in real time and finding things with the people who are there. And I love film and TV and new media, um, but there's not as much time for that. You're really lucky if you have a director who values that. Um, and, but most of the time, I don't, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but like, you know, for the, um, the network TV stuff that I've done, like you, you don't meet your other actors until you're literally in costume and makeup and you're running through a scene yeah. um, with them suddenly. And it's like, make sure you hit this, make sure. And it's very, it's very hard to like lose yourself and be ready to create. And that's a whole, the whole bag of tricks that I'm in awe of and that, like no judgment or shade on it. Um, there are things I love about it, but I miss being in a room and digging into like that scene that we did in R and J together, you know, with like the Friar and Julia and like unlocking things and having aha moments and having an amazing director um, pull, pull stuff out of you and you pull stuff out of each other. And it's the magic that, that create is created with a company. Um, even if the company's two people or three people, but like large too, it just is so special. And, and then you put that on stage and the audience becomes part of that company and it's so immediate. And though we're like, you know, actors and we're like, how's the house? Like it's, it, it's real though. Like, are they with us? Yeah. Do they hear mm -hmm. us? Do they like us? Oh, they're funny. Oh, they're dark. You know, it's, I'm just miss that. And then last, I think with, you know, not to get too political, but with what we're going through, I think there's something so immediate about theater being able to speak to like what's happening immediately in yeah. our in our world, uh, even if it's a classic play that's already been written, we know that we can create. You know, we can bring the contemporary into a classic. Um, and film and TV often it's been shot well in advance. You know, and so it's sometimes hard to be as immediate and responsive. And I just wish right now we could all process. Um, you know, what's going on in our country across the board, um, just social justice wise through our theater, because it's a way to communicate and, and tell stories and bring each other together. And also for me, why theater um, is like empathy. It just taught me empathy, you know, to, to no end and it keeps teaching me empathy because we have to put ourselves in other people's shoes, sometimes multiple people's shoes yeah. in one go. And to see through their eyes, and I think it's a it's just a a skill that I wish I don't know every every sort of education system instilled because I think that's how we'll understand each other and make a difference. Yeah, it's, I I think part of the magic of theater is it bypasses the intellectual and it affects you, and then later you try to think your way through it. But yeah. you know you can experience you can have that empathic experience in a ritual, you know, yeah. with a lot of other people in the room, their energy's there and focused on the actor and he feels that or she feels that and they transmute their performance. And that, that just, there's just nothing like it. There's, I, I realized the other day, it was like, I miss meeting people in the lobby and getting yeah. the lobby all packed and it's busy and people have to get to think, I miss that. I miss that energy. Yeah. We're all so alone right now. And with these giant elections happening, it's just, it's super crazy. Um, all right, here's my last question. Okay. So what, what's success for you? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's been an interesting, it's been an interesting couple of years for me. And then to, to then have a busy last five years, but specifically last like two ram up into a pandemic that just stopped our, yeah. our creating um, but also stopped a hamster wheel. I, I, for me, I've heard a lot of friends say this too. I was on a bit of a sort of like, hamster wheel is the best way to say it, of, of 
creating and needing to needing the next thing and needing to feel like I was, I don't know, like growing or building on something or building a career. And mm -hmm. um, I was really uh, as amazing and grateful and um, challenging and learning experience that waitress was and being on Broadway was, I mean, the, the difficulty of just performing in a Broadway show is, is epic. Um, I, once it ended and I kind of went through a, um, a, an intense like loss in my personal life, which is how the whole thing ended, um, that I needed to take a break from and then came back and did an off Broadway show here in New York. And then basically had things lined up and the pandemic hit. I was left with this sense of like, okay, I've achieved something that I always wanted to achieve and was told I should achieve like Broadway, right? Yeah. That's yeah. tight. Um, I don't know. West end is like the only other thing that, like as actors, I feel like we're like, okay, shiny thing, you know, and, but, but I, and I love it. And I think it's amazing, but it's, it's, that doesn't encompass like, I don't know, every, everything. It doesn't yeah. encompass like your soul calling um, to your, your art form. It doesn't necessarily mean like, like doing something for two years is, is going to stay fresh. And, and so there's a lot of different things to sort of juggle. And I don't want to sound like ungrateful, but it, I think it really is a, a real question of like, how long do you, how long do you stay? And, and how much do you need to, to, um, I don't know, met metabolize and, and to refresh basically a new thing. And, and I also don't want to just get into a thing of like, what's new, what's next. Um, and I found myself at once the pandemic hit, kind of realizing that I'd lost some connection to why I was doing it and what I was picking and what I was um, putting out. I do believe in like you put out there what you want and it'll, it'll find its way to you, even if you don't know it. Um, and I don't know if you just put out there like I, I need something to prove my worth. I need, I you know, it, it, like the insanity of like, okay, I did a Broadway show. When's the next time I'm going to get to do a Broadway show? You know, it's like, you can't just relish in it. And I, I think that that's unfortunately somehow bred into, into artists and, and actors and probably because it's scarce in such a hard career. Yeah. Um, but I really just like was forced off the hamster wheel and had to think about what was success for me. So to long answer, <laughs> really thinking about what is it? And and like sitting with um, organizing and, and my old childhood home and seeing things like that I've just keeping in mementos, I keep things from every show, but thinking about some of the, why certain productions just stay with me, like, like, the groups of people, but the aura, the feeling, doing the show, and Anna Karenina was one of those right up there at the height of that in terms of like, art, just the artistry of it, our fellow, like our cast, our director, um, the, the play itself, like getting to do, getting to have, being asked of that, that production to like be dancers and sing sometimes and you know, <laughs> like almost like, gorgeous you know posing and then the intense acting those are those are the things like those are success for me so it, suddenly it's success isn't linear and um and that's kind of what I'm wrestling with right now is like what is a career that isn't built on I you know I start in this company at like intern and work my way up to blah 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 and then I'm an associate and then I'm a, you know there's it's not a linear path even if even if you're like the big wig at your theater like <laughs> every show is different and is new yeah. and you become a beginner's mind and you become new again and I miss that and I realize like I think that's success is that I get to keep being challenged and keep having I, I just like pray for new a new project that's going to like invigorate me as much as you know the R&J's that we did and that I've done and Anna's and um things, things of that nature, um, the waitresses, like, and, and I've, when I think of it that way, I'm like, I've been really fortunate. And I just hope that I can keep being because I don't know, going for, I think something about going for like the, 
I don't know why I'm going to say the wrong metaphor, but like the golden egg or, you know, Gold like every time, just, yeah. yeah, the holy grail. It's sort of like, oh, it's all around me. It's in my past and it's in my future and it's right there. And it's, and I might've had to say no because there was another one at the same time. You know what I mean? It's, um, it's a, it's a little hard to hold for a Capricorn brain, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm coming to terms with it. Like, oh, because, because, um, that's what then I feel like really accepting that it's not just a ladder that you climb, which yeah. I think will teach you in, in this country, especially um, if you realize just how sort of tangential and beautiful that is uh, and that it's the community too, then I feel like you can start making some life choices that are for you that are like about self care, but also like, you know, I'm coming to a point where I'm like, I, I do want, okay, I do want a house. How do I square that with being an artist? And I, I want a family. And a lot of those things, I feel like there's a bit of a myth that you have to sacrifice. And to some extent, you know, like we were saying, you do have to be ready to like be flexible and move and change and grow. And that's what this, that's why I love this, um, this medium of ours. But, but I also feel like you have to be able to like live your life. And that, when I, I don't know, there's something about the consistent kind of trying to climb a ladder that isn't a ladder and slash a hamster wheel that <laughs> you stop doing that. So Yeah. Well, it's so ephemeral and it's so kind of, I remember I spent like hours in the afternoon in a darkened theater rehearsing how to fold a napkin at the right place so it gets the laugh, literally like half an hour. And I'm utterly, utterly fascinated by that. Um, and I was, Lloyd Richards came to talk to us when I was at ACT and he directed tons of August Wilson stuff. And he said, you know, you can't recall, you can't control the quality of the return, but you can control the quality of the investment. And I thought, you know, really all you've got is time to spend and what, what you focus it on. Um, that, that's what, that's where my sense of value, I think, came from. It's like, oh, it's what I'm interested in. And there is no, there is no career. There is no single career. There's, you know, you put it together. Everybody's lives are so different. It's so challenging and you got to figure out a new one, a, a new way to do it. I think that's the only way to stay in the business, I think. Yeah, I think so. And to, to be like robbed of the ability to just put, do the next thing and to yeah. have to sit like, what do I want to do? Or, slash, what is this part of me that loves to create through this medium, through this collaboration? Because I, I haven't wanted to just like self tape a monologue and share it on social media. I have, that's not where my creativity wellspring right. is. Yeah. And I've had to sort of be like, deep, go through a whole like mental anguish of like guilt, like, well, you're not creating something or like, you know, why doesn't a Zoom play feel as fulfilling, you know, just warring with myself and then kind of coming back to like, okay, well, what is my, what is my creativity? Who is that little kid in me that yeah. I wanted to do this to begin with. And I don't know what, what is about the napkin that I want to just take <laughs> <in> there. <laughs> what if I pull it out this way? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a great place to end. Thank you so much for consenting to do this. I, it's amazing. We haven't, I don't think, last time I saw you was at Santa Cruz, I think, doing Midsummer a million years really? ago. Yeah, I think so. Cause that was after all the Tahoe stuff, right? Yes, that was yeah. after Tahoe. Yeah. It feels like I saw you. Were you in New York or maybe we were, I don't know. Anyway, it was, that was the last one I remember. Was Anna after Midsummer? I feel like Anna was after Midsummer. Oh no, we, I saw you during Sense and Sensibility. Oh my God, that's right. That's right. You're right. That's correct. I, I think I came and visited you guys at your You house. did. Yeah. <laughs> As you will again. Yes. Uh, once we get I this damn thing out of the way. Well, I miss thank California. you should come back out. I'll, I'll find a way. Okay. Thank you so much again. And thank uh, you. I hope to see you soon on stage. I know. I can't. I, I hope so. And I miss you. And I hope we get to make stuff again soon. Well, 